Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, it's with great pleasure that I will be uh, introducing the next three speakers and somehow trying to keep uh, track of time for this blog. Um, the next three speakers um, are dreamers with their feet on a solid ground, which means that uh, they're pragmatic, but their thoughts are nowhere near the ground, uh, but they surely know where they want to go um, and how to get there. I believe you'll be uh, as fascinated as I was when I had the pleasure of uh, having a quick chat with them um, as to what they're working on and what they want to share with you. The first of them is Dr. Sarah Diamond. Um, Sarah is the, vice, is the President and Vice Chancellor of OCAD University, Canada's University of the Imagination. She brings expertise in digital transformation, data analysis, and design thinking. She's an artist, she's a designer, and a computer scientist. Today, Sarah will, among other things, uh, talk about data analysis for sure, but why we should be obsessed about it and give us some insight as to the visualization of it. For those of you who know her well, or who had the pleasure of uh, hearing her maybe in the past, you know how brilliant she is, interesting, knowledgeable, and passionate. So it's therefore with real pleasure that um, we will have the chance to have Sarah joining us again this year and address the assembly. Now, I don't know if I'm introducing the three speakers right now, or do I take a pause in between? So Sarah, I will let you speak. Well, what, what a perfect, um, incredible moment to follow the um, cultural track study conversation. It couldn't be a better setup. So um, what I want to talk to you about today um, is really about telling stories and creating experiences with data. And I have about 15 minutes to do that. Can you hear me OK? OK, great. Um, so um, you know, I, I, you're, you're on side with using data. And um, in a sense, what I'm saying to start this out um, may not be for this audience, but it's just to really underscore that we have this phenomenal wealth of opportunity with big data. Uh, you know, enormous volume and variety. And uh, what really matters with big data is how it is analyzed and how it's used and how we uh, make it meaningful through representation. Um, and the limited character of uh, data collection systems both by most cultural institutions and by the sector really has been a constraint. And um, Lily and Moore, for example, um, argue very strongly that we have to see data as an asset. And uh, historically, we've been anxious about data, seeing it as a tool of rising accountability demands on our very overtaxed sector. But I think there's other ways of looking at it and thinking about it. And um, you know, as well as the culture track study, there are some other examples, certainly in the US context, of the ways that um, not-for-profit arts organizations have been very effective, as well as humanities research organizations, which are highly threatened right now in the US, um, have used um, data collection to really understand their audiences, their users, and the impact of their activities. So um, I want to um, talk a little bit about a number of um, case studies that um, we're involved with that sort of have parallel in, in I think, relevance and interest um, you know, to the cultural sector. And then I'll tell you about three um, projects that OCAD University is working on which have direct impact. So um, uh, recently, um, a, a good thing around collaboration is the four university presidents uh, in Toronto work very closely together on issues that we think are of preeminent importance to um, our institution and to Toronto as a city. So we developed something called uh, Student Move Toronto. It's a case study. Um, we, uh, we, the Royal We, our faculty, collected um, the largest data set in North America relative to student transportation choices, both active and passive. We link those choices in how they travel, where and why they choose to live, and their engagement with their campuses. And it was you know, a questionnaire, but we did ask for a lot of narrative. I have to say, there are tools to analyze narrative. So apropos of the previous conversation, asking people to actually answer questions that you can analyze. So, um, um, so the methodology really was to um, correlate their decisions, um, and I'm showing 
be actually, unfortunately. Um, so showing some of the, um, the visualization work we did in our institution. So things that we discovered through visualizing the data um, are that students will stack their courses if they live far away. They have less curricular flexibility. Um, the data we visualized shows their choices of transportation, uh, their distance from their school, uh, the relationship of housing and transport decisions. So why am I showing this to you? I'm showing this to you because very similar kinds of analytics could be done in terms of the positioning of cultural resources, what I describe as cultural deserts um, through parts of the city, uh, the correlation between um, poverty, distance to travel, to achieve a cultural experience, etc. cetera. Um, and um, of course, by visualizing this data, um, both for we worked with TTC, we worked with a lot of the transit authorities um, in the GTA, but also with our campuses to help to understand student behavior. So um, I'm giving this example because it's a way of thinking um, kind of across a number of different boundaries using different kinds of data sets to create relationships with what are the impacts of culture. Um, the smart city movement. Um, I'm very involved in um, looking at the ways that we can use cultural analytics to understand um, effective urban planning, mixed use development, complete streets, in other words, multiple forms of transportation, businesses, the location of cultural institutions, etc., to support cultural diversity um, and to understand the relationship between tourism and the economic impact of tourism. Um, uh, I'll just go back a little bit here, the culture, the Chicago cultural plan. Um, part of what uh, Chicago has looked at, which I really would encourage us to look at, and I'm very um, excited to read the outcomes of the SFU study that you're leading, um, what Chicago has used data to understand um, really has been economic impact cultural attracts and retains creative professionals and their employers. We know that, Richard Florida studies, et cetera. But public safety, how culture breeds positive street life, how culture revitalizes and sustains property values, how culture attracts and transforms the lives of at-risk populations. Um, and uh, the UK recently ran a study, Jeffrey Krosick and Patricia Kasniska, understanding the value of arts and culture. And uh, they use data, so again, data collection to understand not economic impact. They were tired of hearing that the only reason governments should um, invest in culture was because of economic impact. Instead, they looked at the ways that culture is transformative in terms of the safety of neighborhoods, transformation of people's lives in multiple ways. So again, reasons for um, using data analytics. Um, a project that we've been involved with, one of my really favorite projects that our lab has undertaken, Visual Analytics Lab, has been with the City of Toronto, um, with the Mayor's Office and Parks and Recreation. So um, we used open data sets from the City of Toronto to analyze and represent data from recreation centers to understand the changing nature of demand over time and the services available, to explain and then solve the problem of sign-up crunch through visualization. So um, we looked at the appropriate metaphors for Toronto. Uh, these are two faculty members, Patricio de Villa and Isabel Morelles. Um, with a group of students, they sketched until they found the right metaphor that could translate into a graph. Um, and then they used the metaphor of condos, um, placing these resources through the metaphor on a map of Toronto. And you were able to actually um, look at the wait list and then to um, compare recreation centers comparatively over time. So investment in um, supporting sports and recreation within these centers, demand, and then in fact where the demand was flowing in a real time kind of way. So as a parent, um, what we were helping to do was solve um, and actually reduce levels of anger on the part of parents who are trying to sign their kids up for recreational services. And we used data visualization and an open, a set of open data sets in order to help the city to do that. So I'm showing you this because it's not literally and directly arts and culture, although there was a component there, but exactly how we can use data analysis to be very effective. Um, sentiment analytics. Um, we do a lot of work in our lab with uh, what are called um, is effective computing uh, with large data sets using um, what is uh, artificial intelligence, algorithms, and sentiment analytics. Um, so I'm just showing you some really um, 
beautiful, and I hope you can see them, examples of work we've done um, using metaphors with very large data sets with the Globe and Mail. We work closely with our national newspaper um, in order to visualize things like, you know, how do each of their columns feel? What do sections of the newspaper feel like? Um, how do their users relate to the different kind of sentiment within um, uh, editorial comments um, and, uh, you know, within the sections of the newspaper? So again, this is sort of behavioral studies. And now the work that we're doing, um, and this again uh, very much relates to Jill Robinson's point, um, we're not only helping the Globe and Nail um, look at what people say they read, but um, using analytics, we're actually tracking what they do read. Um, and attention, how much time they spend on articles. And then we've built actually uh, a tool for editors at the Globe and Mail to be able to visualize and uh, move content around based on the actual behaviors of their readers. So these are called recommendation engines, and we've been developing the visualization tools for that. Again, there's a complete parallel if you think about, um, you know, people who uh, consume or experience culture, um, you know, both at a kind of urban level within particular institutions to be able to recommend to people using not only what they say they want to experience, but what they actually do. So I um, wanted to, um, I think I'm okay for time. Um, I wanted to show you a few projects which I would describe as beautiful data. Um, and these are, again, coming out of our lab, and then I'll, I'll show you some of our current work. So um, uh, we have a number of faculty who do um, absolutely stunningly beautiful and quite accessible work with data. Um, it's a field of very intensive interest on the part of our students. Um, it's across visual arts and uh, graphics design and our digital futures program. Um, we have made a promise over the next five years to not only um, support all kinds of literacies in our community, um, and of course visual literacy is a huge one, but data numeracy. So this is a, is a big transformation for an art and design school, bringing together the left and right sides of the brain. And we're already doing this, but we're now making sure it's really ubiquitous um, within our student population. And some of what our faculty are doing um, are just absolutely beautiful work. So, so this is work uh, by Patricio de Villa. And um, uh, the first piece of work that he did um, is, um, um, of course, um, this is with the CN Tower, not the Trump Tower, though you could do this with that and it would be equally amusing. But um, basically, um, analyzing using sentiment analytics to um, analyze tweets over a period of time by uh, folks during Nuit Blanche and then lighting up the CN Tower based on the kind of emotional quality of their Nuit Blanche experience. Very good for Nuit Blanche because we're always trying to build those um, um, uh, audiences and make sure that they're having a great time. I'm actually the, uh, uh, the chair of the um, advisory committee for Nuit Blanche, so we, we like to know the sentiment during the, um, the event. Um, this is work that he's been doing, um, looking at uh, large data sets from the African diaspora and looking at ways of um, analyzing the impact of the diaspora in terms of culture and the movement of culture through that, um, um, the, the kind of positive impact of that terrible diaspora. Um, and um, I'll move on now to some of the work that we're currently doing. So um, we're working with the Canada Council. And again, this is very much about storytelling using data. Um, I have to underscore a million times that this is a draft visualization. Um, and uh, um, in other words, this is not the final version by any means, but um, we've provided the Canada Council um, with training to under understand data and understand data analytics and visualization. So um, this is something that OKEDU is doing. Uh, it's something called our innovation training program. We're helping not-for-profits um, and businesses become cognizant of data and how to think about it, use it, and represent it. Um, and then we're providing um, a set of visualizations for you um, using Canada Council data that will help you to understand how they spend their money, how it's allocated, to which groups it's allocated, some of the history of that, um, the geographic distribution of that, and we're very committed to making highly legible, accessible, but beautiful visualizations that you can use as a community. We can use as a community. Um, secondly, um, this is a project with Magnify Data, um, Magnify Digital. They're based in Vancouver, um, and we're building um, with them a next generation analytical engine um, that will help, um, at this point, digital media companies in Canada position their product 
and make decisions around the content of their product using big data analytics and AI and a very elegant visualization interface um, to help them with discoverability. In other words, how can they find audiences for their content, uh, direct business to consumer, which is a major shift, and not be reliant on the large-scale distributors um, in Canada, the broadcast industry, et cetera. So it is a way of thinking about it, disintermediation. We feel that this is the set of tools we're developing are of absolute value to the not-for-profit cultural sector. So we'd love to talk about that. Um, and then the third project, oh, these are some of the Globe and Mail tools. And then finally, a project I'm extremely excited about. Um, it's a combination of work by University of Toronto and Oakhead University, um, also working with um, a wonderful uh, architect um, who is um, uh, involved with um, looking at the history of public art in Toronto. So again, using big data analytics um, and natural language processing, um, we have chomped our way through 150 cities policy on public art and best practices going back to the 1970s to 2017. Um, and what we've been able to extract are trends that show the ways that um, public art has changed in terms of how we understand it. We've been able to pull out best practices around policy. We've complemented that, which I think one has to do when using big data, with um, very uh, significant uh, interviews of uh, folks involved in public art from every direction, from developers to art consultants. Had a series of public forums and consultations. Did a case study, deep case study of Montreal. And um, what we will be able to do now is provide um, across a number of segments in Toronto, from the developers to the City of Toronto, um, to policymakers at the federal level, our proposal for how public art in the 21st century could really, uh, you know, make Toronto an international destination, um, building on what is already a set of excellent practices. But the point is that, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, we would have done this work, you know, with a uh, a, a group of you know graduate students reading massive amounts of documents. We were able to use data analytics and the visualization of the outcomes now um, to be able to really move ahead and combine the sort of human component of discussion and analysis with the analytics. So um, that's really um, my story. Um, these are some of the tool, the capacities that we have in our lab. You know, visual design, analytic, analytic methods, uh, kind of natural user interactions. Um, user experience design to really try and make um, uh, data something that is both meanings, meaningful, elegant, and can tell the kind of stories that um, all of us need to be successful arts and culture organizations. Sorry for losing my point in the PowerPoint at some point. I was really trying to rush through a lot of material here.